come to the Royal Opera House, both to our audience up here, uh, Claw Studio upstairs at the Royal Opera House, and to our worldwide audience watching our live stream via YouTube. I'm Emma Southworth and I'm the senior producer for the Royal Ballet Studio Programme. And for tonight's insight, we go behind the scenes as Canadian choreographer Crystal Pike creates her first work for the Royal Ballet for the main stage here at the Royal Opera House. I'm going to be talking to Crystal about her new work, her processes, her thoughts, and, and then we're going to be talking to some of the dancers who Crystal's been working with in the studio. And later we're also going to uh, watch Crystal doing some rehearsals with those dancers at what is really the very first moments of her creation period with the dancers in the studio. Crystal's work will be on, um, on at the Royal Opera House from the 16th of March. It's part of a triple bill with David Dawson's The Human Seasons and Christopher Wielden's After the Rain. And you can of course get tickets at roh.org.uk. Now, of course, we want to hear from you this evening, so please do tweet us by using hashtag ROHMixBill. And now, please, a very warm welcome for Crystal Pite. Hello. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're joining us really at what's a really fragile moment in your creation period because you've just started really with the dancers in the studio. Um, and so I, I think this is a really interesting moment for an audience to hear you talking about your work and where you started but not necessarily where you finished. Um, so going back to the beginning, I think Kevin O'Hare, who's director of the Royal Ballet, um, asked you about three or four years ago to come and make a piece for us. Mm -hmm. But then where did the idea start, or when did the idea start of what you were going to make? It started when I had to choose a piece of music. And that was about a year and a half ago, I think. And I think I missed the deadline a few times, <laughs> even with that. Um, and I ended up choosing a piece of music that I've loved for many years, like probably many of you. Um, it's Goretzky's Symphony No. 3, Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. I'm using the first movement of it. and. It's a piece that I've been listening to since the 90s, when yeah. it became very, very popular. Yes. And I was one of the millions of people who bought that CD and listened to it endlessly. And I dreamed of choreographing it right from the beginning, but um, never really found the right place for that project yes. to land, and, or, or didn't feel ready or worthy or and not that I feel like that now and I'm just, you've, and you're right you've, you've caught me at this I'm I'm in the middle of my third week of this creation and I I've I've gone past the little honeymoon stage of the creation and I'm now sort of diving into the the, the doldrums of doubt and I can feel this familiar terror seeping into the process where I wonder if I've made all the if I've made the right choice yeah. of, of, of everything, yeah. and wondering if I have the capacity to, um, to kind of handle because yeah, it's, it's a weighty piece of music, isn't it? I yes. Think. As, as the title of the symphony is, uh, Sorrowful Songs, mm -hmm. it is very sorrowful. And yes. um, the, I think the weight of the string writing in it, that canon that starts off and gets heavier mm -hmm. and heavier as the intensity builds. Yes. Is, I mean, it's extraordinary, it's quite haunting, but I can mm. imagine it's also quite daunting if you're trying yeah. to match that with choreography. It is. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, at the time when I made the choice to use that piece of music, um, I was busy, as I still am, with, with current events and with the humanitarian crisis that we're facing right now. And because I was thinking about refugees and the movement of humans on the planet. Okay. Um, something connected for me when I listened to that piece of yeah. music and I felt like it would become, that music could become a sound space for that content. And so those two things came together in a, yeah. in a moment. Um, so yes, the music has a kind of weight but it also contains a lot of joy. I feel there's an, yes. exu an exuberance in it and a, a feeling of, of hope and of, of resolve, of, of effort. So there's all this um, beauty that feels like there's so, there are so many human emotions in there. Because Goretzky, when he wrote it, um, or when he talked about it afterwards, he said that it wasn't really about war, because lots of people mm. had read that it was about the Holocaust, because 
I think that it's the second movement that the writing is taken from the wall of a Gestapo cell. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite... But he said it wasn't about that. It, he, his piece transcended anything so specific. Yes. And I wondered how your choreography... Does your choreography do the same thing? Yes, I, ha I have this, the same desire for it to be not specific to any particular time or place or, or, or culture. Or it's, It has to do with um, the, that more universal question of of borders and shelters and interior space and exterior space and um, compassion yes. and fear. And that is, uh, that is a repetitious theme throughout yeah. humanity. And so, like, like Gretzky, I wanted to, to let the piece speak in, in that broader sense. Yeah. Because it's quite interesting, I think, when we were talking earlier, um, talking about Goretzky, and he tried to write music, I think, about the Holocaust much earlier than he'd written um, the symphony. And actually, he couldn't. He, he felt it was too heavy. But I think it does come out in, in this piece yeah. in terms of dealing with those uh, bigger themes. And so, so once you... You'd chosen the music. Do you have a normal process in terms of choosing your collaborators and then working with them? Or well, what do you do next once you've chosen yeah. the music? And um, well, I'm working with my same collaborators, my same de design team that I've worked with on, on many projects. Yeah. Um, Jay Taylor is designing this set, and Nancy Bryant the costumes, and Tom Visser is doing the lighting. And so this is a, a team that I've been working with over many years. Yeah. And um, so... It's, it's a pretty easy decision to make in, in the moment about who am I going to work with. I'm just going to work with them. Um, and it's, it's really joyful to work yeah. with them. Um, so that's almost the easiest part, in yeah. a sense. And do you bring them, once you've had the idea, did you have quite a clear idea before you talked to them about what you wanted to do, or are they feeding into your thoughts as...? I think both. I think at early stages it was, I'm going to make a piece at the Royal Ballet. Do you want to be a part of it? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, and then we move forward. Next question. Okay, the, the music is this. Okay, the content is this. Okay, the, the aesthetic is that. And yes. it sort of goes on, on like that. So things have been, been defined and are still being defined as we go along. And we're not going to give too much away. Mm. Um, we'll leave it for the um, opening night of what it's actually going to look like. But there's quite... Um, when we were talking about uh, how you set it and, and talking to Nancy about the costumes, about not really defining where they are or mm -hmm. who they are and the research that you've done into how you do that. Mm -hmm. and... Well, it's, it's interesting in terms of even just a colour palette, like mm. coming to a decision about that. I mean, when you look at, when you look at pictures of, of refugees today and, and, and what we're facing right now, it's very colourful. It's, it's, it's orange life jackets and gold emergency blankets and, and Dora the Explorer backpacks and pink coats with Barbie on them. And mm. it's bright and colourful and stripy. And it's not what you kind of conjure in your mind when you think of, of refugees. I think we, we sometimes c connect to an older time, to old black and white photos and more of an oldie timey vintage feeling of, of things that have happened historically. Yes. I think, and that's certainly where my mind went in, uh, originally. So <clears throat> that said, we wanted to um, to create a world on stage that isn't specific to any time mm. and is unified and and evocative. Yeah. So so we're, we didn't go for lots of color <laughs> in the end. <laughs> but I've been struck by that looking at the the images lately. Yes. Is how much color there is in these stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to tell you any more about the set and the costumes. <laughs> um, and I think you, you use writing um, in your creation process, but I think that's really a, a personal thing that you do mm. for yourself in, in terms of mm -hmm. making the work. Where does that fit into...? It's a really good question. I, I, I do do a lot of writing just in the process of trying to figure out what the piece is about and also just practicalities yes. and logistics and that kind of thing. Um, sometimes just sketches of, of how the piece might unfold and that kind of thing. Um, but the work that I do in the studio is really nonverbal. It's really uh, not spoken. Um, and I find that there's a separate process that has to happen in parallel to that almost so that I can find a way to talk about what I'm doing. So there's two different parts of my brain. There's the part that makes the piece in the studio and, and choreographs and finds the, the physical textures of what we're doing. And then there's the part of me that needs to learn 
to talk about mm. what I'm doing. And that part of my brain usually kicks in at about the point where the company will ask me for a program note or a title, <laughs> or I'll have to do an interview <laughs> like this, or you know, a whole series of things that are sort of <laughs> pushed on to me um, in order that sort of force me to have to, to speak. Um, I don't feel necessarily like like speaking is my first language. I feel like dance is my first language. Mm. And so um, I, find it, I find these things really hard, <laughs> really, really hard. So I've done, I've done some work um, just trying to define some of the language around how I'm going to talk about things. Yes. And it's still very raw. Um, but it is a very important part. And I find that when I do that process, as, as awkward as it is, I do learn things about what I'm trying to do. And, I, and there's a point, confronting point, where yeah. I have to decide, am I doing what I said I'm doing? Hmm. Does it align? Yeah. All these things I'm talking about, does it actually look like that in the studio? And that is an important moment to, to bring the thing together and make sure that it, that it does. Great. Um, just going back a bit, because I think it's going back to saying how it's taken so long for the Royal Ballet Diaries and Crystal Pike's Diary to lie. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I mean, busy here, but you're in demand all over the world. And I was just thinking it would be quite interesting just to think back about how you how you became a choreographer really or mm. at what point did you think actually I'm a choreographer now rather than a dancer because you danced with Ballet BC first and then you went to William Forsyth's company mm. which was Ballet Frankfurt at the time right um, and were you choreographing during that time yes yes I've always choreographed um, I started choreographing when I was a toddler I know that sounds insane <laughs> but I really did I started when I was maybe three and um, I didn't know it was called choreography. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I was making up dances that I could repeat and refine. And it was to specific music. And I wore a specific costume. And I, I would set things up so people would have to watch it. <laughs> and it was, it was choreography, even though I didn't know it at the time. And over the years in, in my childhood, I, I continued on in that, in that way. And I would choreograph dances on my friends. And I would organize improv jams with my friends. And my, my teacher, my ballet teacher, uh, that I grew up with in, in Victoria gave me the key to the studio. Yeah. And so I was able to go in alone on, on the weekends and keep making things. Wow. And, um, and so by the time I choreographed the high school musical and the, it, all, that, all that stuff. And so by the time I, I entered company life with Ballet British Columbia, I actually had been choreographing <laughs> for quite a long time. And then I suddenly had the opportunity to choreograph on professional dancers, my, my colleagues in the company, which was amazing. Yeah. And um, I was very fortunate because uh, at Ballet British Columbia, uh, in those years, we had a choreographic workshop every year. So had, uh, all the dancers had opportunities to choreograph if they wanted. There was space and time made for that. And that's rare Yeah. Um, and really important. And one thing led to another. And I, I, I ended up having quite a lot of experience as a choreographer under my belt before yeah. I went to dance yeah. in um, uh, Frankfurt Ballet. And, and did um, Bill Forsyth, did he influence your your creation, did Absolutely. that make you see things differently? Absolutely. So when I, when I moved to, to Frankfurt and joined his company, I, I stopped choreographing for a little while just because I was kind of in survival mode as a dancer. Like I just had so much to learn. And it was a really, really potent and powerful time for me uh, as, a, as a dancer and then through that as a, as eventually as, as a choreographer again. So. Um, I learned a lot about the craft of choreography from him. I learned a lot about improvisation yeah. and oh, risk taking and, and tension between ideas and all kinds of amazing things that I still use and I'm still so grateful yes. for today. Yeah. I, I started my own company. Which is Kid Pivot. Kid Pivot, that's yeah. right, in 2002. And, uh, and that's what I've been up to ever yeah. since. And was it important for you at that moment to have your own company that you could choreograph on? Yeah. Was that a natural progression in your choreography? It was always a dream. Yeah. I always felt as a dance artist that was kind of my final destination would be to have my, my own company. I always wanted that. And what does that enable you to do as a choreographer? Mm. So, I mean, because obviously you're around the world choreographing on different companies like the Royal Ballet, but mm. you're, you, Kid Pivot is there. Yeah. And what does that mean that you can do? It's, it's a long-term relationship. Yeah. So there's a kind of... Uh, a kind of trust and a kind of understanding um, that happens between us over time. Yes. And I can build on that knowledge, and it feels like a kind of laboratory, like a group of experts where we all are working with the same set of ideals and um, 
and things bounce off each other. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's very alive, the, yeah. the process between us. And because it's my own company, I can kind of make up the rules to some degree about how long we spend making a piece. Yes. Um, yeah. How much research time do I need? Where do we want to go and work on this project? Who are the collaborators? All those sorts of questions are open. I don't have to make dance work either. Mm. Um, I specifically didn't use the word dance in the name of my company or even my own name because I didn't know whether we would always do dance and I didn't know whether we would always do my own work. Do you want to so, just um, tell people a little, um, why it's called your company? Why it's called, called Kid, Kid Pivot? Pivot so so um, I had originally settled on the word pivot because I felt that um, it evoked a kind of precision. Mm -hmm. So a pivot is, you know, it's, it's a move that's very specific. It takes a kind of rigor and a kind of um, uh, skill to, to, to execute, and it changes your direction, it changes your point of view. And I liked the inherent um, specificity and, and rigor in that yeah. m idea of a movement. And then in counterpoint to that, kid was for the, the outlaw and the pirate and the prize fighter. So it's something that was much more sort of brutal and reckless and um, chaotic, mm. unpredictable. Um, so that the, the tension between those two ideas would hold and, and, and create a kind of energy. Yes. And you know, that was in 2002 when I chose the name for my company. And at the time, I, had, I think I had no idea just how much that ideal of that kind of tension would resonate through everything that I do and become yeah. more and more and more important to me as I go along. Yeah. So luckily, it was, it was well named. <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, I suppose from watching your, your work over the last few years, what I've really noticed is that um, you've made these very big works and you're making, the work you're making for the Royal Ballet is only missed 36 dancers, <laughs> but the work, the Thomas Adesh work that you mm. did that was at Sadler's Wells, um, Polaris was for 60, 66 six dancers, That's right. and Emergence, which was National Ballet Canada, was... 36, 36. Also. Um, So these big numbers of dancers, and then um, work like Betroffenheit that you, mm -hmm. I think he's also come back to Sadler's Wells, was much smaller and more detailed and theatrical. Mm -hmm. um, and and, um, and the Tempest replica was quite mm -hmm. similar. But was that, is that particularly the decision that you've made to make those very big pieces and then mm -hmm. make those smaller, very detailed pieces? Is that, I, is that yeah. an ambition or...? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, with my own company, there's, the budget is a big factor, yeah. for sure. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to hire 66 dancers in the context of my own company, nor would I really want to. Mm. I've actually chosen the, the number of, of six performers in, um, because I read somewhere. I can't remember where I read this, but it seemed it, ring, it rang true for me that where, when you're at a dinner party, the maximum number that can sustain one conversation is six. And then if you have seven or eight, it starts to divide. And the conversation around the table starts to divide into a couple people talking there and a couple people talking there. So I was thinking, if we can hold one conversation, um, that there's something magical about that. Yes. So I've always held that as a kind of idea or an ideal for my own, my own company. Um, and you're right, there's, a, there's more opportunity for detail mm. and, and uh, subtleties and, and, and nuance within that smaller group. Um, we tend to also perform in smaller venues, so um, more like a space like this, which is a very, very different theatrical experience for the audience yeah. than seeing something in the Royal Opera House, obviously. So it's a different kind of work that I create for a smaller venue. Mm -hmm. That's also, I mean, that's a conversation in itself, for sure. <laughs> um, but for the, other, for the other projects that you're talking about, um, one of the reasons I've been choosing to work with such large casts is just because I can. Because yeah. I can I have the opportunity to work big mm. in a place like the Royal Ballet, yeah. where there's an infrastructure and a budget that supports that many dancers in the room for yes. a rehearsal process yeah. and performances. And what does it enable you to do as a choreographer? It, en it enables me to work with a lot more simplicity also. Yeah. So in a situation like this where I, I have to work quickly, mm. um, I can't... I mean, as it turns out, these dancers are amazing, and I'm able to do a lot of great things. But I can't rely on the fact that I'm going to have time to be able to build the kind of complexity in an individual body that I'm interested in. But I know that if I work with simple structures in the individual bodies, I can get that kind of complexity if I use many bodies. So yeah. it's, it's kind of like 
simple idea yeah. plus small variation yeah. times 36 dancers equals a lot of complexity, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is... I might have to get you to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, anyway, I don't know. But um, I guess what I'm saying is if you put 54 people on stage and they just do this, it's quite beautiful. It's quite compelling. You can watch that for a while. <laughs> you can. Um, with six people, you probably couldn't get away yeah. with it for long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or at least I we could. We could try. We could try. <laughs> try. Um, so this is your first work for the Royal Ballet. Um, is it always different when you step into the studio with a company that you don't know? Or do you have the same things that you go through to, or tasks or whatever that you go mm. through with companies to get to know them? Or yeah. Has it been very different coming into the Royal Ballet than it would you know, to one of those other companies? Mm. In a way, my strategy is usually the same. I, I usually show up with some pre-made choreography, some phrases that I've worked out on my own body or, or with yes. some students that I work with sometimes. Or, and I come in and I, I kind of put that in the room and see how it goes. And I learn very quickly about them. Yes. And they learn very quickly about me. And uh, we just kind of build the relationship really fast. I think the challenge is that I have to build the piece, I have to choreograph the piece at the same so, moment as I'm getting to know them. That's a yeah. tricky thing for the first time that I'm working in a place. Yeah. Was to come back and make another piece here, I would already be that much further ahead. Yeah. But I did have to spend you know, a week and a half getting to know yeah. people, and, and I'm still getting to know what they can do. Every day I learn something more about their abilities, which is so exciting. <laughs> And so, yeah, it makes me so happy <laughs> to see that I'm able to do what I really want to do. That's yeah. great. So there's that part. Um, so teaching just raw material, raw phrases mm. that we all then, it becomes also the shared language. Yeah. Yes. becomes yeah. the building blocks of the piece. And actually, we'll, we'll show you some of those building blocks um, when we get into the rehearsal, show you what we started with great. and how we use them. I think that's probably a good moment um, to pause. Okay. Thank you so much for that um, insight into the raw ballet work, but also all of your other work as well. Um, so in just a moment, the um, dancers from the Royal Ballet are going to join us, but we want to hear from you tonight. So please do remember to tweet us using uh, hashtag ROH Mix Bill. Now we've got six dancers that Crystal's been working with in the studio over the last three weeks. Um, we'll see them in rehearsal soon, but first of all, they're going to come and talk to us about what it's been like working with Crystal. So please give a very... <laughs> <laughs> a very warm welcome to Kristen McNally, uh, Isabella Gasparini, Misha Babri, Solomon Golding, Calvin Richardson and Joseph Sissons. Hello. Sorry, I've got a lot of people to talk to now. Um, I've got a question that I, I've been asking myself this ever since I, I worked here, which is how do you go, uh, I suppose, in your heads but also in your bodies from doing Sleeping Beauty, which you're all rehearsing at the moment, you're performing Wolf Works, which is a Wayne McGregor work, and then step into the studio with Crystal, who you've never worked with before. How do you do it? <laughs> yeah, did you want to... Do you want to go? Oh, go on. <laughs> OK, so I think it's, it's really important to kind of compartmentalize each of those things that we're doing. Um, mm. uh, we're so lucky to have so much rep here, but it's, they're all so completely different. Um, and uh, it's, it's just important to kind of keep those each separate, separately, um, I would say. Um, I think I will struggle with doing something so contemporary into doing Sleeping Beauty, but I guess as part of your warm-up, you already prepare your body to be pulled up for something classical and more grounded for contemporary. But we shall see. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, what, what's the challenges so far? Because you haven't, you haven't had three weeks yet mm -mm. working with Crystal, but what are you finding the challenges of, of Crystal's movement, but also what, what, what she's demanding from you? I mean, as you're saying, this is the first time we've worked with Crystal, so her movement is foreign to our bodies but it was great when um, you first came in and you did those couple of days and there was um, kind of an, an improvisation which was led mm. really clearly to help yeah. us feel and get into the way uh, Crystal moves and it's just brilliant the way she's kind of started creating the piece in that she's built phrases so we yeah. were able to learn directly copying mm. yes. um, something rather than 
you know, trying to make these complicated things straight away. It was nice to just get these. There was about six different phrases, but yes. we were able to learn the movement from her body. And that was the one thing I was yeah. talking to you. I, um, I really loved getting the information firsthand from a female body. I don't know what it was like mm. for you. It's, it was so, mm. it was just so different. I know yeah. everyone's bodies are different, so you interpret it and have to make it work for yourself in a different way. Yeah. But I was just loving the fact that I was seeing a woman move and yes. show us the, the movement. There was a different kind of energy and quality, which I've really loved seeing. Yeah. Mm. And, and some of you do choreograph, um, or you've done some work for our choreographic programmes. And <laughs> 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 it's like you can't call yourself a choreographer when we're in the room with Crystal. <laughs> exactly. Um, but are you, start, are you learning things? From Crystal, as she's creating work on you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, with any <laughs> choreographer. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, definitely. Um, from start, like a stylistic point of view, with the type of movement that it is, down to how she's running the rehearsals, how she's preparing everything, um, and that goes the same for any new production, new creation with Wayne, for example. You know, you learn things each time. It's different again. So, yeah, definitely. And I, again, I was like, oh, you know, it'll be great. I'm going to kind of really see how she puts something together. So I thought, OK, you know, we're starting with the phrases. And I thought, OK, so, so I could make a phrase and then we'll put it all together, OK? And then suddenly it just goes into a world when you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> it's, gone, it's gone away, but, it's, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. And, um, Joseph, this is your first season uh, with the Royal Ballet and you've come from the Royal Ballet School. But what, what, how are you finding working in a, a different way again than, you know, the work you've done before here? And this is first season. Mm -hmm. I didn't even... <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I think, I think the best thing about working with Crystal, especially as, like, a new dancer here, is she yeah. makes a really safe environment in the studio. Yeah. So, like, there's no right or wrong. Like there's different ways of doing things, and she yeah. takes what you do, what you do, yes. and changes it into something better, something that looks nicer. But like it's still part of you, I suppose. Especially as a young dancer, it's not as stressful to come into that environment just because it's really safe and yeah. connected. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Crystal, I don't know whether you're finding because um, a lot of um, our dancers have worked with Wayne, whether you know have gone through a different process than maybe if they were learning a, a traditional classical ballet. Mm. Um, whether you've noticed that they adapt, you know, in a particular way to mm -hmm. how you work and... Yeah, I've actually, that's been the most wonderful thing about the last couple of weeks is seeing how quickly that you've been able to assimilate things and um, just the trajectory that they're on in terms mm -hmm. of what, how they're learning and, and coping and flourishing in the, in the work. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought up this thing about how, all the other repertoire that they <laughs> have going on at the same time, because I'm mean, switching gears from one hour to the next sometimes. I don't know how you manage it. Um, so mostly I'm just delighted. I'm just having an amazing yeah. time with them. So yes. feel so lucky. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's an ensemble piece that you're creating, right. which, again, is, is probably quite different from other works. Um, I don't know whether any of you have got any comments about that. You know, you're not learning, you know, as if you were doing Giselle or, or something similar. You're very much working as a body of dancers, or when I've been in the studio, mm. you have. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, that kind of started as well from... Um, the workshopping that we did, like the whole company was involved. Usually our casting just goes up on the board and that's, mm. that's it, you know. Um, but being in a studio and kind of, it kind of being an even playing field and we're all in there just working together, there, was, there isn't any of that kind of... We're all, like, it's all even and all balanced and I think that is something which is quite unique to having people like Crystal come in. Yeah. We kind of start a clean slate, so people who are new to the company get opportunities to be seen and dance on stage and yeah. you know it's it's more of a for me personally is more of just a kind of community sort of endeavor as opposed to it just being us kind of being you know looking at the board and seeing where we are where we're supposed to be i think it's just more of an organic kind of way and it kind of shows in the piece and when you've seen it and we're kind of all in it together there's no kind of real rank there's so many people from different ranks in it all together and it's kind of more of a whole community mm. piece as opposed to a, you know. Yes, which is different. 
Um, we're going to watch some rehearsal now, so I don't know if you just want to go and get yourselves ready. Take a moment. Take a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I think we're going to start with the phrases, because I was talking about them earlier. Maybe we could... T what if... Are you guys all in the downstage group? Uh, I think you are, right? Yeah. From the beginning. Yeah. So why don't we just do that version of it? And we'll, we'll pick it apart, so just so you can prepare. Sorry. Great. Um, and while the dance is just getting ready, I don't, could you just give a little bit of context, if mm -hmm. you know yeah. the context of where this fits, um, what, what the music's doing at this point, mm -hmm. and sort of where it fits with, within the overall piece? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. The, the music, the way I see it visually, is it's a little bit like a, like a palindrome, where it starts very minimally and then builds in terms of complexity and intensity and volume up to this high point about here in the middle. Okay. And then it drops out and you connect with this lone soprano. Yeah. And she's singing a lament. And it feels like the whole piece, Goretzky's piece, but I'm also oh, trying to do the same thing in the choreography, mm -hmm. that the whole piece kind of zooms in at that point. So we've gone for this, this mag the magnitude of this like, colossal story and then zooming in on this one particular moment or the story of loss um, and then from that moment where I feel like we've zoomed in it it opens back up again at this high point and then continues down and down and down and down and we're left kind of where we started yeah. so what we're going to work on right now is right at the point where the music has kicked back in after that that window yeah. after that little portal of the lone soprano we kick back in um, with full strings, which Colin is going to simulate over there. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't even know how many strings. I think you've got about strings? 10 different parts to play, haven't you, by the end Probably. of it? Probably. <laughs> how many strings do you think there are on the top of your coon? What do you think? How many strings are? 45, 45 musicians? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's intense. <laughs> yeah. How many strings are on and then the brass? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, we're about here. We're about here at this point in the choreography. Great. So I think what we'll do is we'll just work on it a bit. So should we just... Great. I'd just like to say, this is Colin <clears throat> Scott, who's a Royal Ballet pianist. So do you want to do... Um, do you want to sort of go into where you kind of are in the room? Like in terms of where you actually are kind of sort of there? <clears throat> OK. So maybe what we'll do is let's go up till... Should we go up to the point where we get to here? Just to there, five, six. Maybe and we'll stop. Does that make sense? You'll remember when you get there. Yeah. Oh, here, there, there. I remember the arm. Yeah. OK. So Colin, yeah. could you play it from the beginning of the third part? Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll wait those same two eights that we always wait. OK. All right. Do you have enough room? You can spread out a little. Yeah? OK, there you go. <clears throat> Okay, thanks Colin. Great, thank you. Beautiful, you guys. Great. So, we are going to be specific about da, 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 from here the movement of this leg inwards as you duck under this um, arm. And the feeling that from here, that you're going to think of dropping your head inside that space and, and pulling it so that we feel like, first of all, we're leading with the head, yeah, and then after that, we're leading with the arms. So you're through this way. Nice work. And actually, it's also great to see that the hands that were here maintain that same kind of tension through the fingers as you do that whole 
business coming through. And then that, that ball, they roll over the face, and then you're down, and then up, and you're here. Great. And seeing if you can, right, maximum stretch away from that knee so that you can think of this pressurized feeling of your hands reaching for your knee at the same time as your upper body's pushing away. Beautiful. And then from that low place, we just try to stay low so we wipe across the face. Yeah. Can you think of just from here, just bringing your eyes to the front so that I get this little flash of your, of your eyes just before your face disappears? It's like you're erasing, erasing your features. So you can actually make contact with your face, but I get to see it just for a second right before you wipe, wipe it away. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then as this comes back, think that from this place, you actually try to leave your hand where it is and move your head backwards away from it, yeah, and I guess it's important the trajectory of the back of your hand that it's it's heading towards the floor. Sometimes I think what happens is it gets a little too high. It's nice to see that sort of diagonal relationship. Of yeah, 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 yeah. It's nice, great, great. And the front foot, is it turned out? What do you think? Yeah, turned out. So we turn it out. Okay, yeah, that's good. And then from here, think of can you try? Can, the thing is with your elbow. Thank you of you doing this more with your shoulder blades rather than your elbows. Can you try to mo move your arms by, yeah, that's better, yeah. So what, I'm thinking, what I think I see you doing is with the hands, and you wanna think of using your shoulder blades to pull that forward. Yes, nice, and I think you could probably take a wider step. This leg it wants to go a little further. There you go, and then deal with this position. Yeah, deal with that position, that place, that's great. And then from here, you wanna think that there's a bit more of a shearing action, but yeah, that's better. So, yeah, that's it. So from here it's away, it returns, and then it's over the leg, over the leg. Yeah, so it goes. So see if we can find, a, the hard part is moving your, your weight over the, uh, the right leg on the second part. So see if you can fight for, for that moment. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Great. That's better. Yeah, one more time, Calvin. So from here, you're here, and boom. That's better, yeah. I think you can move your ribs more. You're doing a great job of moving your head, but I think we can actually pull through the ribs a little bit more. Yes, exactly. Yeah, see if you can find a little more distance there. One, da da da, da has better, yeah. Great, and then we're gonna use our shoulder blade to move this arm inwards. Rather than using the fingers to lead, we're gonna use the shoulder blade to pull that arm in. Great, and you can really think of sliding this arm down along the edge of your thigh so that that's the path that you set. So you roll it over, and then think of your thumb sliding and pulling your arm along the thigh. Yeah, and then here we're gonna take a risk, right? We're just gonna take a risk. We're still in the zone where we wanna be taking a risk there and finding out the limit of how far we can push that. So see if you can play with that. Yeah, and then Joe, just be careful that from here that you're, it's like your foot, your right foot wants the floor. Yeah, sometimes it just comes up a little and there's a tension that wants to happen in, in your leg that is already at this point w wanting the floor. That's better, that's it. And then once you've anchored that, then you can think with a rolling over. Yes, that's it, that's it. So when you send your weight over the back leg like that, it works beautifully. Over the back leg, yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, good, and then as he's coming in, think that you actually wanna implode your chest. As these arms are coming in, that you're actually imploding the chest. Sometimes what happens is I feel like you do, you do this action, but maybe a little late. Think it already is happening by the time your fingers begin. That's beautiful, Misha, that's it. Yeah, yeah, one more time. So think it's already pushing inwards even, even sooner. So as you're sliding along, this is the front leg pulling in, that's better. So, Equal pressure from fingers, and there you go, that's it, that's it, that's it, great, cool. And then immediately, once you've landed here, the feeling of the analogousness, analogousness of this action, so the foot, the knee, and the two elbows, that those are, have the same intention, yeah. And by the time, even before you've even fully reached the full extent, you're already starting the tilt. You can feel like that's already tilting in, and then Isabella, just be careful that from here, you wanna fight for the ceiling with that left elbow. Uh, just the first one, let's just, um, can we go back from here? This one, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so sometimes, and I think this is something we also have to be careful of, that's great what you're doing, is that from here, that we cheat the, de the, the descending curve. So instead of it coming with you, you cheat it, so even as your body's opening, the descending curve stays on that side, yeah. Good, and then we wanna echo the same feeling in your hand with this one coming over. So it's big, wide, spiky fingers coming over, yeah. There you go, great. Now think of this, 
Think of leading with your hip first. With your hip first. There you go. That's it. Yeah. That's one spot you're going to have to keep fighting for, I think. Sometimes what happens is we move the whole thing as a unit, and you want to think of it as a sequence where you go hip first, and then the leg comes around the corner. There you go. That's it. Yeah. Better. That's great. Can you guys think that this action actually pushes more behind your head? That you feel, yeah. So sometimes what I see is like two circular arms that kind of do this, and I think we could actually squash it a little bit more. So it actually, yeah, passes behind your neck. So still want to fight for that, um, the, the feeling of your nose staying vertical, and this whole thing happening around a head that's just floating independently. Yeah, that's better. That's better. And then Isabel, can you push a little harder off that front leg, just a little further back? That's better. Yeah, that's it. And then remember, we're going to dig the face down into the, into the space in front of you as you start to reach for that leg. Yeah. And again, this leg, this foot is wanting the floor, so don't let it float up too easily. It feels like it loses tension when it does that. It's nice to feel like it's descending and turning out, descending and turning out. That's it. That's it. Good. And yes, beautiful. And then keeping your head anchored way low down there is so satisfying. And then <clears throat> make sure that, yeah, that's great, just your back arm you make sure you chase your back leg with it. So it's analogous. Your right leg and your right arm are analogous. There you go. That's it. That's great. Can you guys feel like from here you're being picked up by your elbow and your spine is echoing that same motion? Yeah, that's it. So you, it's kind of like you get sucked up into Yeah, there you go. Great. And then this action from here, you want to think that this goes past your knee. So am I on the right leg? Yes. Yeah. So from here, you can push a little bit from the back leg as this passes, so we can accentuate the rolling of the shoulder. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot about the other leg. But yeah, that this, this is rotating at the same time, yeah? But the feeling is that you can actually, before it starts to turn out, push this way first, and then turn it out on the return. Yeah. Turn it on the return. Yeah. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to lift as well. Yeah. So it passes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Great. I love it that it looks like you're like lying on your own leg there. It's beautiful. Yeah, you actually are. <laughs> yeah, just lie there. <laughs> and then, Solomon, when you do the big flap, can you think that you actually drop your chest lower during the flap so your arms are perfect? We want to think of, ah, there's a pulse downwards. Boom. So that you think of going a little ball changey back foot ah, a little later than that. So you go, boom. That's it. That's it. That's the rhythm of it. So, ba, bum. Yeah. yeah. That's it. So sometimes what you do, everything, right, it's just that there's a, it was missing the pulse downwards of your, of your chest in that moment. It's the same thing that we do in the flight pattern combo, where we pulse downwards with the chest as the arms go. OK. Um, this is opening on seven. Can you think of trying to travel? It's a little bit of a weird moment there with the step on eight. So you've got the release on the seven. I think one of the things that's going to make this work is the effort that you use to get on that back foot. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So it's the effort in your body to try to get yourself over that leg that does what it needs, makes your back do what I would love for it to do. <laughs> yeah. So let's go from, can I go, can I go from here on the one? Okay. Seven, eight, one, two, three. Okay. Remember this is an L shape from here that we go through to get to there so that it, it digs. Yeah, so rather than thinking of, um, of your torso going up and then down on the diagonal, think that your torso goes up and then drops through the vertical on its way. Duh. So you get low at the front and then send it back. Yeah. Great. OK, sorry, let's do it again with my counts from the one, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one. That's better. That's better. Great. And then let's just check these arms. So you've gone back, back. This goes, oh, we're, gonna, we're getting so low on our way there, aren't we? Can you give us a demo? So low on the way there. So you are just turn this way, it releases. And you're going to drop so that from here, when do your arms go past? I think they pass, when do your arms pass your front leg? Yeah, maybe like that. When do you feel like, in terms of the trajectory of those arms, it feels like maybe we swim, like we swim through 
something down there on the way? Yeah, I guess we could think of it that way, so that the, the swim actually is on the down, downward diagonal as opposed to horizontal, because you're going to be so low, right? You're going to be <laughs> from here. You're dropping your back so low that you actually could carve out a bit of floor there. Yes, yes, that's very nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. Carve a bit of floor, yeah. Great, and then remember that from here, we didn't go this far, but from here, the feeling of your ear dropping. Remember, if you didn't have this action in your arm, you would fall to the ground. This is the action that's keeping you upright. So as this is extending, think that there's actually like a, there's an opposing force both this way and this way, but there's also this way and that way, right? Those two things are rotating this thing and this thing, and at the same time, they're both reaching in opposition. So it's under a lot of pressure. Yeah. So Kristen, that's great. Just keep your head, like the trajectory of your ear wants to be a little further. That's it, that's it, a little further that way. Sometimes it goes a little, just, yeah, that's great. Okay, let's keep going. So from here, this brings, you bring your, are you bringing our feet together? Is that the idea from there? Yeah. Great, and then feeling that, that feeling of pressure, it's difficult to move that arm, even though it's fast. Five, that's it. So see the work right through your shoulder. Great, and then we're gonna carve out, we're gonna wipe, we're gonna wipe the wall in front and the wall behind. So sometimes what happens is we miss the, the first part of it. So it's getting that, yeah, we've got just enough time for it, you know? Great, and then, this is pretty much, do you wanna just do that much again with the music? Okay. Okay, we'll go from the same spot. Thanks. Okay. We'll stop there. Beautiful, you guys. Beautiful. Um, you know this thing, um, it's really satisfying to see you s keep your ear low to that side for as long as you can, and that it's the reach of this arm that changes your head to the other side. Yeah, so you really feel that, yes, exactly, your head has no choice but to change as this pulls. And sometimes what happens is you already start to look for the corner just a little soon. So see if you can let the head linger back and let it be guided. That's great. Misha, I think you could let this, as you pull from here, let this ear drop to the floor a little more. Yeah, so this way, you're gonna actually be tilted on that side. Yeah, as your hand is sort of rolling over, right? So you've got this. This is, sorry, you're here. Here's this coming around. And now here's the reach, and here's your head changing to the other side as you reach for into, the, into the lunge. So by the time you hit the floor, it's probably um, back to neutral but it'll pass through. That's it, that's it. Yeah, you can linger there a little more. You can linger there a little more. That's better, yeah. Okay, okay. I forget, how much time do we have left? Does anybody? Go until 8.30 if you want. Okay, all right. You guys okay? 8.30, <laughs> oh my God, okay. <laughs> okay, um, why don't we pick it up from Let's just go a little further. Um, why don't we pick it up? We can actually, we could actually just go from any, from any one. Any one will do. And we could pick it up from um, eight, one, like on this would be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two. We can keep going. And then does everybody do the same thing? Or do people start to break off? Oh, yeah. Going into the knee, are you got, do you got, mm, you used to. <laughs> I remember, 
you used to do this. We'll go into the knee drop then. Do you, is it one, two? One, two, yeah. Let's just go from there. Let's just go from the one, two, three, four, five. This is a, let's go from there directly. Could you give us a little four counts intro? Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Colin, when you get to, can we talk about what happens here in terms of the opening of this foot? So I think you've got reach for the knee, if I'm not mistaken. And then remember, we're going to try to um, hold something from the prior task. So we're still, this hand is still wanting the knee when you reach for the ribs. And then, actually, it's even before that, isn't it? So can I go from, you, slip, you, kept, you got to here. And where were you, first of all? Here. You have the right the knee. Ah, that's what it is. It's the hand on the uh, that comes off the floor. Do you pass underneath it? I think so. I think you go like this, and you pass underneath this hand. And so this hand is actually still wanting the floor, right? Your left hand wants the floor, and then you grab your knee. And then your left hand, your right hand, still wants the knee, but has to come off while you grab your rib cage. And then let's see if we can make a bigger deal about this shift over the, the foot. But Calvin, can you keep your head upstage? so it doesn't become visible until you grab the back of your head in the next move. Yeah, that's it. So we make a bigger deal about that last change. Great, so it's so nice to see you guys kind of all headless at that moment where you grab the, the neck and then there's a bigger shift. There's that, and then when the arms open, we go, is it right, left? Right, left, yeah, <clears throat> left, right. Right, left, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Here, and then we're trying to keep, we're kind of, we're trying to keep the head on that side as we reach around the corner. Yeah, and so trying to lock eyes with maybe that corner for longer. Could it be? Yeah, I think so. There you go. And your feet go in, out, I believe, yeah? Just like what you just did. So this, this heel has opened up, and then that same heel leads inwards as you go to the ground. Yeah. Great. It'd be nice to see you've been under all this tension in the choreography up, up till here, but let's say that when we get to here, there's a real sense of, of release, like that it's sort of heavy and relaxed is the feeling there. And then as soon as this starts to kick in, you go zzz, you zing right back up into tension again. So you've got to put this hand down, right? Yeah, three. there, three. <laughs> um, the trajectory of your head can you think that you lead with your eyes? Lead with your eyes first. There you go, exactly. So you kind of corkscrew up from, from there, nice. And then it would be so nice, you guys, to go honk and hit that just a little harder at the bottom. Yeah, and your hand is gonna come to life with tension so that we feel like there's a surprise in the, in the arrival there. Yeah, so Misha, just turn your palm so it's, it's like there was a laser beam that would hit the floor somewhere about over there, yeah. Just drop your thumb in just a little bit. Uh, this way, sorry, sorry. yeah, that's better. Hmm? Sorry, is this like stretch? I don't know. No, I think it has to be bent. Is it bent? Because then we need, we need something to do. We still need somewhere to go, which is straightening it there, yeah. Okay. So let's keep it bent so that we have something to do with it. The trajectory of these hands, can you think, when you, when you bring them up to your face, that they're, I think they're slicing maybe too far yeah. behind you. Think that they slice past your cheekbones, past the tops of your ears on their way. Yeah, so sort of slice through the side of your head. Yeah, nice. Okay. Let's, let's, lead, let's do that part one more time from the knee drop, and then we'll move on into the sextet, okay? Okay, so we could, anyone, thanks. We'll give, can you give us four counts in? Thanks. <clears throat> Great, okay, that's looking really good. Um, 
So those were a couple of phrases. I mean, what, how many phrases are contained there? Maybe three. Three, maybe there's a scoop up one. and there's So that's basically three short phrases that we glued together to make that longer sequence. Um, and I think like you said, there are about six, six bigger phrases and then maybe two smaller ones that we use. There's the, the flight pattern one and another one, maybe the zigzag head one or something that we used. Yeah, scoop loop, other little variations. But roughly there's about six phrases of movement that we, we built this whole section with. And I think you saw maybe three of them just now. Okay, so we're gonna skip to another part. And um, so if, up until this point in the piece that we're about to show you now, we've been with all 36 dancers on stage. So we've watched this build following the kind of palindrome of the music. We've watched it build in terms of intensity and complexity, but always with the, with the big group, always with the masses of them all as kind of one entity. And there's a certain point where, um, where we start to kind of morph into these flat, what I call these flashback tableau, where we start to see elements of story coming into the piece, where we start to recognize um, events from life. And as, as quickly as they are manifested, they dissolve and go back into something more abstract and neutral. And so there's a, it almost like it rocks and breathes like that. It goes from story so back to kind of abstract again and then continues on and then just it morphs into a story and then returns to abstract. So this is kind of like morphing into a story that sustains for a little while and becomes stylized and um, more physical, more complex in terms of the bodies. So should we just go from the beginning of it? Do we want to mark it first? Why don't we just mark it first, just to kind of get back into the zone? Okay, we'll just do an easy mark with you. It would be great. So this will be, um, sorry, Colin, this will be the beginning of the eighth in the first section. In the first section, it'll be the beginning of the eighth, the, the sextet, double sextet. Um, is that right? The beginning of the eighth, I think it is. Great. Okay, so we'll just mark it with you. Easy, easy. Um, five, uh, give us the four for nothing first. Thanks. <clears throat> So we've got the new thing that we made today, the jump up and over. This is with Isabella and Calvin. And we're going to try to dive in on the three, I believe. It just makes me feel like you might need to land her just a little, little bit, you know, a little sooner, I think, so that we can, so that I think this three is going to take mm, maybe more than just one count, I guess is what I mean. So two, three, so that maybe she's kind of landing by the two. Yeah. Uh, the other thing was... Let's, should we try it for real? Yeah. Okay. We just started making this this week, so it's it's pretty pretty raw still. Thanks, Colin.
work, you guys. Way to go. Thanks, Colin. Great. Beauties. Um, I'm going to talk through, you know, the part where um, you're heading to the floor with your forehead and you're heading to the floor with your foot. Um, it's, yeah, you swung. She's got you back behind your head. It feels to me like, I, I think you are landing on the one, but I think you need to put a little delay because... Could you think you could like yeah, land or like, well, I think what it is is slow down and then just speed up towards the end so it feels more like it's aligned with her timing. And I think you still, even if you end it puts you like a little late, I think you'll still be okay, able to yeah. make it. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> can I just check the position of the landing? So she, this is the one we were just talking about with, with Isabella. Yeah, coming up. I think seems to me like she's here. She goes up, nice. Ah. Okay, I guess what it is, is if you think at just at the end that you could think of finishing this a little bit more open, right, like so that the landing actually finishes this so it can have a bigger change of her body through you. So do you want me to come maybe, a little bit more I think down? maybe that's what you need to do, yeah, maybe. I don't know if it's, if there's time for it. This way, a little further, that's better, that's better, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so even if, if your, if your direction ends up being more lateral as opposed to just straight through. Yeah, I think, wait, can I just see the, the grip? So, <clears throat> you're like this, coming down. Ah, so I think we still wanna have her relate to this arm. So if she was to pull away and let that slide, maybe that's what we could do. Yeah, 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 so that you actually do this with it and follow through. So and I think so. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, you'd have to let go, but you could do me do it there, like yeah. just there. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. One more time, the same idea. <clears throat> there. That's better. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think that'll be fine. Thanks. Yeah. I hope it doesn't make you too late, but I think it's okay as long as you get down sooner. Okay. Um, this is you going into. Misha, let's take a look at what happens with your feet. I think what's happening is you're like, like your feet are too wide at that mm -hmm. point where you reach the foot. Think of keeping your, your feet tucked a little bit closer to each other so that you keep... <laughs> there we go. That's better. Yeah, so that's great. So you can, it's, like, it's like a little small switch and then there's a really long extension through the left leg. That's it. And it's nice to see it twist so that it's pulling, pulling you out of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then from there, I think that you're leading with the ear to go down. So if what I see right now is you're going this way. Actually, I think you should reach with the, as if, as if when someone's picking you up by the ear. Yeah, yeah, that's better in terms of the trajectory of your head. Yeah. That's great. Do you want to try one more time from where you reach for the floor? There you go. That's right. Yeah, so I think already from the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah it's just reprogramming. One more time, same spot. So you're here. That's better. I think what it is, is you're transferring your weight a little too soon. So if you did, you did this, think that you stay on this leg as you start the beginning, this way. So what's, what I think you're doing is this, even though you're leading with your ear, you're pulling. Think that you push already with the leg in, in unison with the ear move. So you're pushing with that leg at the same time. So you're pressurizing that front leg. That's better. Yes, 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 that's yeah, it. That's it. Yeah, great. Pushing from the front leg. There. There. That's better. That's better. You did it better a moment ago, but that's right. It's about keeping, it's like making that uncomfortable choice to stay, stay with more weight in your front leg as you start. It's like you push yourself up from the foot, push from your heel, kind of like, Rrr. you've got it. Okay, then... Joe, at the end, when you come sliding in, can you think by the time you're reaching in that long arabesque with your hip up and everything sheared over and open, that you're already engaged in bringing that foot, your foot already wants the floor. It'll bend and you'll be reaching for the, for the floor on that side. So that it never actually really fully achieves any position. And it's a, it's a low trajectory, so yeah, yeah. So I don't think you need to go too high with it. It's more like it's already falling by the time you even manifested the position. Yeah, that's better. I also think that maybe you're bringing your body with it too easily. Keep your body with, keep your body with Kristen. Keep your body with her. There you go. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, so your leg, you're still, I won't even see your, 
head yeah. until your foot's almost on the ground. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> okay. Just need to check. I know you guys know this, but let's just check this one more time. This is the very first thing after you uh, fling Kristen forward. She slides in. This head is going to go over your back. <laughs> let's just practice it one time. I watched the tattoo of the today. Yeah. I thought there is a way I can coordinate it, but ah. I don't seem to be able to. Okay, let's see if we can I figure it out. I'm a bit confused when where it yeah. should come from. As Me well, too. I finished the circle. No, I'm totally confused about <laughs> it too. So let's, let's see. So I don't know. There's her. There's her. There's her slide. This pulls her up. She stays low. That's it. That's it. And now with, and then from just that moment, that's it. Just go straight there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That's gorgeous. Can you try that one more time? That was it. That was it. So that was really great timing with your head staying low. Mm -hmm. So this pulls her up. She stays low. And it's at that point, yes. That's awesome. And then we're going to put a little delay in too. That's it. That's it. Thank you, Solomon. That's great. Yeah. Great. And then just at that moment, so from the landing, and you're going to go step, step, yeah? Can you think that this is coming out of your front shoulder? This, yeah. So, right, so that I see this coming up on the diagonal. It sort of feels like pushing through the feet, sliding and pushing through the feet with more intensity. That's better, yeah. Boom. So we really feel like there's, a, there's an up and over quality to what you're doing. And even though you might overshoot and have to reconnect on the, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, okay, let's leave that for now. You guys okay to just sort of walk through what we did today? Yep. Yeah, we're gonna work a little bit on the duet before we stop. Just walking and talking through and you guys are done for now. Thank you so much. So I'm just, this is a duet that we just made mostly today <laughs> um, for these guys. So it's really fresh and um, I haven't, I haven't done any editing or really any finessing on it at all. It's just raw right now. We started making it yesterday, spent about an hour on it. And just to give you context, there's about an hour on it yesterday and another hour on it today. Basically, it's where we got to. So take your time. We'll just, what, we'll just go through the moves, and I think then we're going to be out of time, right? Yeah. And so this will be without music, Colin, so we'll just do it in silence. Yeah. Why don't we start from... Let's just go from our beginning that we're not going to use. Okay. Yeah, why not? <clears throat> just because it's, it's a good way to get you guys into the, into the, into the zone. So not using this, not using this. Using from about here. You guys want to just try one more time from, let's start from where you just, you, you got out of this jump and just the part where you're going to pull them over yeah. onto your back one more time. I think you can make a better connection there. It's, um, it's this. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, just the one arm. So from here, just this arm. And then you're going to start with this arm. There you go. And then, yeah, swim, swim, jump. <laughs> yeah, want to just try, let's just try one more time from uh, just this point here where, ooh, did this thing, she just went over, just from where he lands, this is a leg over, let's go from the elbow, elbow. go from the elbow and the, the, the fall of the elbow. Great. 
Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Way to go. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you for all your comments online. Um, here are a couple that have arrived. Um, Ondine Dancer says, I'm majoring in choreography and seeing female choreographers like Crystal is so inspiring. Piero Delano says, I'm impressed at the quality of her creativity and how much she can see in minimal movements so that expanding somehow simplifies complexity. Um, do remember that Crystal's new work is here at the Royal Opera House from the 16th of March as part of that triple bill with David Dawson's uh, The Human Seasons, Christopher Wielden's After the Rain with tickets at roh.org.uk. So a big thank you to our wonderful dancers, to our pianist and of course to Colin Scott. Um, Colin Scott, our pianist, um, and of course to Crystal Pikes. Thank you very much for joining us here in the Claw this evening and thank you for joining us on online wherever you are in the world. Good night.